Hi, welcome to Wetpixel Live. I'm Adam Hamlin, I'm the editor of Wetpixel, and we'd like to thank XIT404 for sponsoring this episode. XIT404 do a range of exciting accessories for uh, cameras, including focus knobs, um, zoom dials, various other, um, uh, some really nice um, um, universal zoom rings, um, and some great tools. Please head on over to XIT, that's as it sounds, 404.com. Um, and I'm joined by our regular contributor, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hey, Adam. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Um, and I thought I'd ask Alex a, quite a big question, I suppose. But um, so I thought I'd ask Alex how he organises his day's photography, what he does to be um, have an efficient workflow in the field on, during, on a day to day basis. Well, I I'm, you know, think it's really important for photography. I mean, I'm typically diving, running workshops. so I'm not just organising my own day, but I'm yeah. organising the day for a whole bunch <laughs> of photographers. Yeah. But yeah. I actually think it's really critical for, for success. You know, yeah. how you go about getting your opportunities underwater, how prepared you are for those opportunities are as important as anything and as anything in underwater photography, really. And I think almost every underwater photographer can trace in their history when they stopped going diving like a diver and started diving like a photographer and the impact that that had on their pictures. And so I guess the answer to your question relates to all those things that we do that make us more photographers and less just scuba divers. Yep. So I think the first thing for me is to understand what the where we're planning to go the next day and why we're planning to go there. So, you know, as underwater photographers, we, we don't have a lot of flexibility on lens choices. You know, yep. there are systems you can change some lenses around, but the way to get great underwater photos is to have an understanding of what you're likely to see and to optimize your equipment for the types of shots of that subject matter that you want to take. Yep. And that comes from understanding, you know, what subjects are there, but also what the conditions are likely to be, you know, and, and those conditions that, you know, involve everything from visibility to currents, to waves, you know, to sunlight, all those things have an impact on how you might want to set your gear up for the day. So I think that starts the, the question. The other thing I would say is if, if you have control over the diving schedule, as I always do because of running trips, it's really important that you dive as a photographer. And, you know, one of the simplest things that you can do is to dive sites more than once is, yep. you know, figure out in the area which are the sites that are most productive and keep diving those sites. Yep. You will always get better pictures second dive on a great site than going to a new site. Because yeah. you know what to expect, you've thought about the equipment, you can really then optimize your gear for the shots because you, you know what's coming your way. And yeah. particularly if it's a really special dive site, it'll keep giving you surprises and extras on top of what you know is there. You know, and a, a classic example for me is, is diving at Ras Mohammed in, in, um, in Sinai in Egypt. And that's a site that I've dived, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. Yet mm. every dive has similarities and every dive has special surprises. And the more I shoot it, the better the shots I get. You know, yep. my, my last picture to be awarded in the wildlife photographer was taken there more than, you know, I think 15 years after, you know, my first picture that had been awarded in the wildlife photographer had been yep. taken there. And yep. I was still, you know, still able to find new shots. And it's and I've been diving that dive site, you know, many, many times every single year in between until the last couple when they're not allowed to go. Um, and so, but the point is, you know, repeating dive sites leads to great pictures. Yep. You don't get, you know, you know, you typically get those great pictures when you are ready for it. And that's because we want to optimize our gear for the shot, not have some camera system that can shoot a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it yep. does slightly worry me now that the housing manufacturers, the camera manufacturers, they're pandering to the market in that new photographers come along and go, oh, I want the ability to do this and this and this on a dive. Yep. And so the, the, the gear manufacturers are going, oh, well, we can buy, make that for you and sell it to you. Yeah. And now it's being marketed to us as like, you can do this and this and this on a dive. That surely is good for you. And it's not good for your photographic output. You get, you know, underwater photog or photography in general is not about taking a bazillion OK shots. It's about yeah. producing those special images. And you get those special images by optimization, by refinement, by focus, not by trying to do everything all at once. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, and, I'm getting uh, and, quite sidetracked on your question. You already. are, well, it's, it's not uncommon, is it, for us? Um, but yeah. the, the, I mean, certainly, I think that, that video, for example, is another bit of a red herring. A lot of people, you know, most camera systems now will shoot pretty good video. Um, 
And so people say, oh, I don't want to be able to shoot video and stills. And it just doesn't work. You know, your lighting is so much different. You know, I think yes. the key thing is, is, is it works. You just but don't get well. anything special. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah. I think it, that's, you know, that's yeah. where the arguments come. People go, oh, yeah, but I got this and this and this on a dive. Of course yeah. it works. And I'm just like, yeah. And I would delete those. You know, <laughs> why are you yeah. showing me, you know, you know. So, so okay. So it's measured on our best work. Not so we've decided. We've decided on our dive site. We've decided Sorry. what type of subject we're gonna we're gonna we're going to um, photograph. Um, and what's the next part of your ritual then, Alex? What's well, what, so do you, what do you do in you preparation? Know, gear assembly and testing. You know, all yeah. are part of one. You know, the time to figure out something is not working is when you, you get in the water. And I was diving yesterday, um, and I checked my camera, checked my strobes were working, check everything working. Didn't check my Zoom gear was engaged. Ah. You know, you know, you've got to check all those things when you're diving. And, oh. you know, I did check it before the dive, but I'd already pressurized my housing by that point. And then I had to open the housing up again, um, you know, depressurize it, fix the Zoom gear into position, which was just a case of a quick click. Um, and it was in position. And then off I go. So, you know, check all those things before the dive. Um, then, then you're ready to go. Luckily, I didn't find out underwater. I did find out before the dive. But but still, it's really important to make those checks, and then you're ready to make the most of the dive. And and it, certainly, I think most important thing about those checks is 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 you need to actually physically take a picture and look at it on the LCD screen. Yeah. I mean, worst case, you've left the lens cap on. Um, everyone's done it, you know. Yeah. But, or battery um, or no card or. Yeah, you know, the point is take a picture and basically look at the image on the screen. And and you know, if you if if, if there is an image on the screen, you need to figure out why. Um, and that's that's something you know a lot of people will run through and press buttons and you know and but actually physically see to make sure the camera's taking a picture at the surface and that that's a, a really acid test um of, of everything working um, and if you've got a zoom gear or a focus gear on as i learned yesterday or re reminded myself yesterday yeah. you know check that as well when you're at home doing the test before you yeah. go to the dive site or in the in the room so yeah, yeah. test shot um and then yeah then then often often enjoy things and then yeah so, so okay, so obviously we, we fall off the boat, disappear down, do whatever we're going to do, come back, come back. We come back to the boat. What's What do you do then? I mean, obviously we've got some time hanging around the surface. That will vary depending on where or what we're doing. What sort of things do you do between dives, Alex? So I think this is where what I do um, is I will happily tell you. It's not necessarily what I recommend. I think this stage is a bit more what works for me. Yep. I generally, certainly on a liverboard and, and very often on a day boat, I open my housing after every dive. I do this because that's how I grew up doing photography. I you know, grew up shooting Same film cool. and you yep. had to open the housing to put a new film in. So yep. it was no, you know, it's never been an issue. I've never been one of these. Oh, I'm pumping up in the morning and it stays sealed to the rest of the day. That way it can't flood. I open my housing after every dive and I always have. Um, I do that for two reasons. I do that because... I always feel safer with my pictures on my computer. And mm. once they're on my computer, I can then have a, have a look at them. And mm. if you see me on a liverboard, I'm normally responsible for a whole group. So I need to be very efficient with my time. You know, you'll come up for a dive on a liverboard. It will be dinner or be some food five, 10 minutes yeah, later. Yeah. In that yeah. five minutes, I'll have my housing open, my memory card out. I'll have it downloaded in my computer. Um, if, you know, in the days of slow downloads, I'd leave it downloading over over breakfast, come back after breakfast, take the card, put it back in the camera, and um, get ready for the next dive. Yep. Um, but I've got those pictures on the computer safe, and I've also got them to learn from. Yep. Because, you know, as I said before, the key to great underwater photography is, is diving the same sites repeatedly. You know, you're going to improve your photos on the second dive if you have a look at the photos from the first dive properly beforehand. So mm -hmm. if you can't download or you don't want to open the housing, you know, towel over your head, Actually, um, the other day I was shooting um, in freshwater and I, I was just holding the camera underwater and it was very hard to see the screen. So I actually ended up pulling my jumper up, my T-shirt up over my head and pushing my camera up underneath my T-shirt <laughs> so that I could see the housing under my T-shirt so I could see my LCD screen properly. You know, yeah. so whether it's towel over your head or whatever, have a proper look at those pictures. See how, the, how everything is looking. If you can get them on a computer, great. If not, you know, get them somewhere else where you can really have a good look at them. 
there's a there's a possible technique here if you you know if you're unwilling to open the housing or can't open the house for some reason um a lot of cameras now have the ability to transfer images wirelessly which if you're close enough with a camera inside a housing you often can do um and so you may be able to to look at wireless then their preview images really on a phone or on a tablet whatever um you know so that you know obviously you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to have a laptop out out on a, on a rib in the in the sea for example whereas you might well be able to have a you know a, 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 a an iphone or, or a phone or or something that you can yeah, so drive back yeah you know there, there are options around that but i think i think the the important point here is that obviously if you don't look at your images once you've taken them you don't you can go back in and make the same mistakes all over again you know, and, and you're not actually then looking at well that worked that didn't and obviously if you can then draw up a short list of what worked on the previous dive then then you can go on and capitalize that and improve on it on the second dive mm. so so it's a, you know it's a very much a kind of learning process trying to figure out what's working what isn't and the best way of doing that is to review images absolutely um, so, something so, I always something I always do as well on services I will tend to change batteries. Less important with with my cameras with 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 the camera batteries, although I appreciate a lot of cameras probably do benefit from a, a battery change in between. But certainly strobes and and, and this is a discussion I've had in the past years. Yes, I've similarly I've got to disturb the O-rings, change batteries, but you know the day that I don't change the batteries, that's the day on the second dive that the I don't know, dolphins arrival and if it's a bad example something arrives and i need to shoot a lot of pictures and i've no longer got to charge my batteries so i'd much rather get in the water with a full set of batteries even if the previous set isn't exhausted so i will i will change batteries religiously between dives um if i assume i have the opportunity to do so so i think for me it depends on what, what i'm shooting um yeah. you know for example um you know if it's a macro trip or you know particularly wide angle macro we were talking about recently um you know that i run my strobes on the lowest possible power for wide angle macro and you can take like you know two three thousand pictures before they get exhausted on most macro trips though your strobes will generally last all day unless yeah. you're doing something particularly unusual so i'll generally just you know run my strobes the good thing is a lot of the better strobes now have good battery um related okay, things so my ccam strobes give a percentage um, they yeah. give a percentage. It's not a very accurate percentage. I think one of the worries is when when the, the strobe can report the number in detail, you believe it. But the CCAM, my CCAM batteries, because the batteries are old, you know, they're good down to about 30 percent and they're dead. You yeah. know, so it's clearly not 30 percent. It's, you know, yeah. so, you know, it, it, but you you as the, when they're your flash guns, you learn to use them. The Retras have a traffic light system again. You know, it's green, amber red and then red flashing for the different percentages and i think that gives you a feel for where you are with your yep. flash cuts yep. but i agree with you if there's a if there's a possibility that you might have a dive that requires a full set of batteries in one dive then change them yep. Yep. um but if if you know you're just doing macro all day and there's no you know no possible way that something's going to come along that you can shoot that would require your batteries then i wouldn't change them what about what about lenses, Alex? Do you change lenses between dives? So yeah, I find myself more productive as a photographer when my gear I change my gear each each dive. And that's kind of more a psychological, creative, inspiration for me point of view. So, you know, for example, last week I was diving on the south coast of England. It was thick plankton bloom, you know, three meters visibility at best very limited what you could do it was basically macro shooting single strobe shooting you know there wasn't really a lot you could do you know i had the right lens on for what was possible in the conditions there wasn't really an option to change but i still like to make changes to my gear um between the dives so in that case i changed my lighting i did the first dive with two strobes on the housing the second dive i did with a single strobe on the housing so i didn't go in with the the second strobe at all um, mm. and put a snoot on it and then the third dive i use a single strobe with a reflect with a reflector on it you know mm. so um but but again dive with just one flash gun um you know and I, I like that process of changing it because i find it keeps me give it makes me keep feeling like i'm making progress i'm making changes um right. so you know i like to change so typically on a trip i like to change lenses between dives I guess also from a portfolio point of view, you know, you're also building 
they may be similar subjects and similar conditions, but you're shooting them in different ways. And, yeah. you know, that gives you a variety of options that you could then incorporate into a, into a portfolio um, or into an article or whatever it is that you plan to use the images for. Um, you know, if you shoot the same, if you shoot the same subject the same way 20 times, <laughs> you've got 20, 20 pictures that are the same. It's, whereas, you know, changing does make it, will make it, make it more useful. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and, and like you, I have, you know, a lot of lenses. So, even if it was a wide angle dive, say, go back to that Egypt example at Ras Mohammed, I might dive fisheye first dive of the day when there's mm. maybe a little bit more interesting light to pull into the backgrounds and you want that slightly wider view. Then mm. second dive of the day, um, the sun is much higher. It's maybe not so interesting to have in the pictures. So I might go mm. to a WACP for that mm. dive, still a wide angle, but giving me a slightly different perspective. Also, mm. having shot fisheye for a dive, you do some shots which you get that big space but there's other shots where you're frustrated, you couldn't feel the frame a bit more. So it's quite yeah. nice to have that change because then you can do the mm. shots that you weren't able to do on the other dive, but there are some mm. shots you can't do as well. And, yep. you know, for example, and then maybe in the afternoon when I know that the soft corals are maybe all going to be open because the, you know, because the, the reef's in the shade, then it's maybe going to be more of a scenery dive. So I may go back to the fish eye and I may yep. say, oh, actually, I'm going to do close focus wide angle on this. So I'll put smaller strobe arms on or, yep. oh, there's something out in the blue. I'm, I want to shoot big scenes, so big strobe arms on. So those are the kind of tweaks I'll make, even in a wide angle day. Um, and obviously, like on a normal kind of coral reef dive trip, I might say, okay, you know, we're doing a wall dive first. I'll do my wide angle on the wall. We're coming into a shallow site second. I'll put a macro lens on, you know, and I, I find that that I like doing the two together. Now, that's the bit I really wanted to say. That's what I do, not necessarily what I recommend. I know lots of underwater photographers find that they have a more productive trip if they do a day or two of wide angle and then they do a day or two of macro and they can really get in the zone on the techniques. I think because I dive and shoot a lot um, compared to the average person that I actually find it Switch better between. for me to be switching around. It keeps yeah. it fresh. It keeps me interested. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I tend to find I maybe get a little bit stuck in routines if I constantly shoot the same lens for, for a period of time. Um, and you know, I think um, I think I think you're right, and I think there's an element of that, that learning to use one system, and then if you've got to relearn it the whole time, then possibly that's more challenging. Definitely. All right, so we've now second dive. If we go, we've changed or not changed the battery, so on and so forth. Um, we go for second dive um, or third dive, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, after that, you would run through the similar process. At the end of the day, what's your what's your your first thing that you do Alex. so end of the day's diving we've done multiple dives now what's what's your what's your your workflow well i mean it's difficult for me because the majority of my diving is teaching and my time isn't normally my own so mm. you know that's when i'm looking at other people's pictures we may be mm. doing some formal teaching and that sort of thing as, as, as you well know on workshops but assuming mm. i'm on a trip on my own um which is, is, is not a common thing i think the key thing is to get in there and look at your pictures yeah um and the first thing that i like to do is get on the computer and then cull the number down a reasonable amount, you know, get rid of everything that you're clearly not going to want to be out there representing you as a photographer. So I'll make quite a harsh cut through the pictures. You know, those who've dived with me know that, you know, I'm technically, you know, experienced underwater photographer. So I don't shoot many pictures that aren't well lit, correctly exposed, in focus, you know, interestingly composed. But every photographer, irrespective of your level, You've got yeah. pictures that for your work are good and for your work are a bit boring. And yeah. I'll, I'll get my, my pictures culled down because I think if you're faced with whether you're judging a competition or looking at your own pictures at the end of a day's diving, having 500 pictures on your computer and deciding which is the good one is hard. If you've yeah. got 50 on your computer, it's a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and so hacking that number down is, is a really important step to do. And ultimately, I'm never going to show people, I'm never going to have time to process, you know, thousands and thousands of pictures. And yes, I have deleted pictures down the years that I regret deleting. And I have deleted pictures that, you know, would have, you know, could have easily been publishable, easily be usable, etc. But as a photographer, I want my work represented by my best work. And once you make that decision, it's easy to delete, you know, yeah. because you think, do I, re is this, do I really want that out there? It's a perfectly good underwater photo. Loads yeah. of people would love to have that photo, but yeah. does it really, you know, stack up to the rest of my portfolio? No. Gone. Yeah. Easy yeah. peasy. 
Um, and and the reason that's invaluable is valuable is it allows you to um, you know to find the good stuff. Now people can also do that process by starring the images. Yep. But ultimately, I'm a big fan of using that delete key. You know, yep. just you know, keeping them forever and ever and ever. You know, I I don't think there's that much to learn from them. They're just a distraction. You know. And I know you can hide them with the stars or color coding or whatever, but I, I just say get them out of there. You know, don't delete everything, but you know, concentrate your work down to the best stuff. I think that's definitely a skill that you can get better at. Um, you know, I think there's a great temptation, particularly when you're you're not traveling possibly as much, and um, you know, the temptation to be trying to hold on to stuff almost as souvenirs of the trip. Um, mm. And you know, that that's understandable. But as you say, when you discover that you've got thousands and thousands of pictures that you actually never look at um there's there's no point in having them you know it's you know you tend to you probably tend to look at the same you know the, the your favorite images um repeatedly and, and the vast majority of them you may not so yeah it makes sense to delete yeah and, and i'm not saying go mad but yeah. i think you know a decent you know carl of maybe taking somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of the pictures away is a pretty good place to be you're yeah. unlikely in that to delete anything that's going to be a superstar of the future for you. Okay. Um, however, I don't cull down to the absolute bone straight away because I think you need both to review a dive or review a shoot immediately afterwards, but yep. you also need to come back to it a couple of weeks later when you've done lots of other photography because yep. may, when, you, when you edit a work straight after a dive, you tend to keep the stuff that worked the way you wanted it to. Yeah. Whereas when you come back to it later, you then realize, okay, well, I wasn't planning to get this shot, but actually I rather like it now. Yeah. And yeah. I think so you don't want to edit too heavily straight away, but you definitely want to get rid of the dross so that when you do revisit the folder, you're not yeah. just wasting your time with 20 shots that are basically the same. And there's no point keeping all 20. Keep, yeah. you know, keep two, keep three. But, yeah. you know, this one, the fish is there, that one, the fish is there, this one, you know, there's no difference between those photos. You don't need two versions of it. Check it sharp and delete the rest. And so then perhaps, perhaps slightly more prosaically, so at what point do you back everything up then, Alex? Do you back it up after first call or before first call? Uh, usually after that, after that, yeah. I'm not, um, I don't want the backups to get big. I don't want to have to go back and re-edit the backups. Yeah. So I have to say when I'm, when I'm on teaching trips and I'm busy, I probably only back my pictures up every three days. Yeah. You know, how, how often does your computer hard drive really crash? It does, yeah. it can crash. Yep. But, you know, if I get something really important, I think, wow, that's a picture that I might be showing people for the next 20 years. I'll definitely back it up. And, you know, yep. that happens quite regularly on, on, on trips. Cause, you know, we do good stuff and you see, you know, you get pictures that you're really excited about. But, yep. you know, if I'm just running a normal workshop and I'm not really getting anything that special, I've done whole weeks without doing the backup to the end of the week. I've yep. got one version. My computer's not going to crash. It's safe in a cabin, safe in a hotel room. Um, you know, I'll back up every few days but yes that's not necessarily what i recommend i'd recommend that you back up regularly um particularly if you're you know not the most confident with computers or this trip is a once in a lifetime trip for you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then so okay so we've now got images on the computer backed up as appropriate um do you put your camera back together again that evening or do you wait for the following morning so generally, I like to stay on top of these things. It's yeah. particularly because I'm busy. And if I have time to do it, I'll do it. Because otherwise, I'll wake up at breakfast and someone will, you know, come up to us, you know, on a workshop and go, oh, I've got a problem with this. Can you fix it? And I might end up spending, you know, 40 minutes in my morning getting their camera working. Yeah. So I try and stay on top of my gear all the time. I'm, like I said, I'm very efficient at whipping that memory card out, whipping batteries out, getting things on charge yeah. so that it's all ready to plug all straight back together again. There are dives where I've ended up having to take in the same lens the next morning, not because it's ideal for the site, but because I spent all my time helping someone else in the run up to the dive. Um, and, you know, that's that's part of running workshops. But, yeah, generally, I'll always try to be make sure you're ready um, that evening. I don't tend so, to pump it up that evening. I tend to pump it up the following morning and I'll do the test shots before I pump it up, not the night when I put it together. And this is where it's almost come full circle from where we started, because it's also very good if you can to talk to the dive team 
um, the evening and find out where you're diving the next day and what the diving's likely to be like. And again, this comes back to, to full circle. We said, you know, and that allows you to make choices about lenses, about lighting, so on and so forth, um, ready for the next day. Obviously, if I don't know, if I have no idea where I'm diving the next day, I will tend not to reassemble my camera because I might put the wrong lens on. So, so generally, it will depend. I do need some information before I can make that decision on that. Yeah, and you want to see the weather as well and things like that. You know, yeah, if, you're, yeah, yeah. if you're in Egypt and it's going to be sunny, then you don't have to worry about it. You know, yeah. if you're in Raja Ampat and it changes every half an hour, you know, yeah. and it's going to have a big impact on what you shoot, yeah, you need yeah. to have that flexibility relatively last minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's been really good, Alex. Thank you. Um, it's uh, it's it made me through. miss all that fun in the field. Though. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> it is sunny here, but yeah, anyway, uh, not quite the same. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Um, great information. Um, so so I think maybe if you want to see the effects of different lenses, so on and so forth, check out Alex's website at amuster.com. Um, and um, obviously there's, there's portfolios and particularly, for example, if you go, if you search Russ Mohammed, that'll be. No, is, is that on your on your website, Alex? Keywords? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can search any any Sinai or Russ Mohammed or okay, that, that would be yeah. interesting to see the see the variety of images from one dive site. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so um, that's great. Thank you, Alex. Um, thanks to XIT404 again for sponsoring this episode. Um, we really appreciate our sponsor support um, and we can't make, make these episodes without them. Please feel free to add your comments and suggestions as to how you organise your day when you're taking pictures underwater um, and drop us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon.